Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mastermind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is the host of the Deep Dive Podcast. His skill set is varied yet congruent. Without fail, his potent spoken word poetry and deeply moving multimedia creations take the viewer on a transformational journey that leads to greater self-awareness and compassion for all life. He has been on the show before, and we had a great time meeting in space and time in Egypt. Welcome back to the show, my friend, Adam Roa. What's up, brother? What's up, Matt? Thank you for having me, man. And and yeah, it's crazy to think that we got to share that Egypt experience. Um, when we I came on the show the first time, I had no idea like that would be the next time we, we saw each other. Yeah, dude, absolutely. I remember uh, I was just about to go and, and somebody messaged me and they didn't know that I had met you. And they're like, hey, you should meet uh, Adam Rowe. He's going. Do you know who that is? I was like, I do know who that, that is. And so it was a really uh, pleasant surprise to land in Egypt because it's, you know, Egypt is intense and it's a very special place. And just to kind of have a connection with somebody to experience that with because you do these things that are just so out of this world, it's really hard to convey you know what actually happened and so to have that same experience was uh was really great man so yeah definitely great to connect there yeah you you and i have like just you know putting anything into words is synthesizing it from its actual potential of what it was and so any experience uh that we even can speak about is only one like hundredth of what the experience actually was so the fact that you and i both know the craziness that that trip was was is really cool yep yeah 100 percent, man well um i i'm just wondering where you want to start like do you want to talk a little bit about how your experience was there or i know you just got back from tour and i had the privilege and honor uh to watch you speak and do your uh spoken word in egypt and man it was it was phenomenal uh as far as like the artist artistry goes is amazing uh, but it's more about the words and the energy behind it it's so smart and we had a little bit of a conversation about how you know we can take these concepts that we're feeling and that we're living and then we that we find value in um and share that in a way where mine is kind of like more direct you know it's like hey you should probably meditate <laughs> you know if you feel like crap you should probably go to the gym um, but your style is taking that you know idea and weaving it through a really beautiful story so it's very uh subliminal and like hypnotic and, and beautiful so probably uh a better way to do it and so i really you know you're you're very talented and it was very amazing and you got to do it uh for kyle cease's audience too which was really great because he's been on the show and he's just such a awesome guy too yeah he's he is one of those dudes who um is blowing up in the personal development space and when you speak to him you can you just know like he's actually in the work. You know what I mean? Like he he walks the walk and walks the talk. And like, um, so I love Kyle and getting to perform for his audience of like 1400 people. That was by far the biggest audience I had ever performed in front of uh, for my spoken word poetry. And yeah, you know, I find that art is um, like biologically human beings were predisposed to receive art differently, right? Like. When you see, when you go to a movie theater, you've already like entered into the theater saying, I'm open to have an emotional experience. I'm actually ready to have an experience. And that's different than listening to like a lecture and hearing someone talk where you're filtering everything through your logical mind. And then at a certain point going, okay, like maybe enough of it filtered through my logical, like, you know, scavenger hunt obstacle course, and I've allowed it to now become an experience. And so for me, seeing the power that art has and people's receptivity to art, um, I find it to be a really powerful tool in the um, mission of expanding consciousness and spreading awareness and helping people shift on a cellular level. So that's, that's kind of why I... Um, include because I also like you will say hey you should probably meditate some more because you know your mind's all over the place I can be very straightforward in a lot of other ways but I definitely like artistry is a huge part of my life and and definitely 2018 I want to bring more of that to the surface 
Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, t I totally agree. I, d I did a lot of study in hypnosis and how through story, that's the number one way to sell or persuade is, is, is through a story. And in hypnosis, you just have an outcome in mind and you weave that through the story. Um, so I remember us talking about you know, your, your spoken word and how you do that. And it made me think, because I actually used to write a lot of poetry when I was younger, just in my journal. Um, and I never put anything out there. Maybe it's like a fear thing. I don't know. Um, but you know, I used to write a lot and actually do that in practice, weaving in a message that way, because from what I learned is very powerful and even testing it one-on-one, -on -one, it was very powerful. So what I want to ask is I know that you did that with each of your, as you go through your set and you're touring around, you have like a kind of like a little message in each one of your um, acts or your, your spoken word. Do you want to talk about some of those core lessons that you're trying to share? Like, you know, when you're, when you're on stage and someone comes to your show, like what is, what are some of those core messages that you want to kind of get across? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the kind of the arc of the show, is the show so the show is called permission to think freely and um i always open the show by asking people like do you feel that you think freely when you heard the title permission to think freely did you immediately say i kind of already do like i'm, I'm a, my own person and whatever and over the course of the show i exemplify and i talk about the, the ways in which we are creating our reality and how um, our belief systems, both individually and collectively, are shaping all of, like, let's call them the world's ills, right? Like um, what you're seeing in, in the, the world with war and the, the war for profit model that's happening and, um, you know, what's happening with the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, Greek refugee camps and uh, building clean water wells in Tanzania. These are all stories from my life that I have that I weave into the show. And then by the end, because it's not just about highlighting what's what's wrong or what's not working. It's also about how do we give people um, tangible ways and understandings of how to shift things in a more positive direction, because the rules or the ways that are like um, society now has been built in a way that it's not necessarily working for everyone like those rules and and the belief patterns individually can actually be implemented in a way that does lead to a thriving society we don't have to reinvent the wheel we just have to take our understanding of the mechanics of manifestation and creation and have them work for us and so like that's the the overarching theme of the show Awesome. Awesome. It's, you know, it's such an important point because when I studied the law of attraction with Michael Lozier, who, you know, wrote a best selling book, I think he sold two or 3 million copies and his, his book was a very how to base, very, very practical. So when I want to learn something, let's say lucid dreaming or be a better snowboarder or get stronger, I just want to know the best tactic for it. You know, if I want to ask to project, what do I have to do? I don't want to know this. I don't care for me. It's like, I just want to be able to do it. And the big thing about the law of attraction is that you, you know, you get, you, basically you attract into your life, whatever you give your attention, energy and focus to. So as a collective, the biggest reason why people are attracting what they don't want is because they're focusing on what they don't want and they're saying words like don't, not, and no. So it's like if I don't want to fall in my head when I do a backflip, I'm giving intention, energy, and focus to that thing. If I don't want to lose my job, if I don't want this to happen, you remove the don't and you're focusing on that thing. So when we're looking at the world as a train wreck consistently, and that's what's perpetuated on the news and in our life and in our Facebook feed and at the water cooler and everything, we can't even create a different reality because you can't think about landing the backflip and uh, falling on your head at the exact same time or living a life that is more fulfilling, more aligned, uh, you know, with who you are. And looking at all the crap in the world, it's, it's kind of like the Buckminster Fuller thing. He's like, you don't create a new world by um, fighting the old, you do it by building the new. And so that takes our attention and our energy and our focus, and it puts it towards what we want to create. And we just kind of allow what is, it's like, we're not saying it doesn't exist. We're not saying it doesn't matter. We're saying, okay, if this is the issue, 
what is the solution? Now let's focus on that solution within our lives and then within our communities. But we first have to kind of um, sort out our own uh, situation before we can do that. Um, so I'll either let you comment on that or I'll go right into a question. Well, it's it's in, well, everything you said I 100% agree with. And um, where a lot of people get lost in this as well is the understanding that your unconscious mind is um, proce the processing power of your unconscious mind is significantly greater than your conscious mind. And so when we talk about the law of attraction, how long can you consciously hold what you want? How, how long can you consciously hold the vibratory signature of having gotten that dream job or that dream partner or that million dollars or whatever it is that you, you consciously are calling in? And the moment that you let go, so let's just say that uh, I'm consciously talking to you and the moment that I stop consciously talking to you and I'm like making myself a sandwich or whatever it is, my unconscious is now the thing that is putting energy out into the universe of what I'm calling in. And so for so many people, they say, well, I have my vision board and every night before I go to bed, I, I say my, my affirmations and I wake up and on my bathroom mirror, I remind myself to say my affirmations in the morning and that's all well and good. But the majority of your day-to-day -day experience is being, um, is not consciously holding the vibratory signature of what you want. It's the unconscious mind holding a particular frequency. And so th that is where the deep inner work comes in reprogramming the unconscious so that you are moving towards what you want even when you're not consciously holding that. Yep, 100% agree. That's uh, that's a really important note, and and it goes deeper, right? Because well, well, you just made it go deeper, but it's it's interesting too, right? We have 70 to 70 to 90 thousand thoughts a day, and most people, you know, those are all creating. Those are all creating a reality as we go forth, and so we're not paying attention to those things. So the more that we can bring mindfulness in, understand how our unconscious works, we're going to give ourselves more power to influence our reality. So it's a, you know, I'm glad you went a little bit deeper there because I, I totally agree with all that. Um, mm -hmm. So what I wanted to ask is, I don't know if you've been on a podcast or someone's asked in depth, but what was the uh, Egypt experience for you? I know you went on a whim. I think it was like the week before you're like, I'm going, it's a very serious commitment. Um, it was a very serious excursion, obviously being in Egypt with multiple astrophysics physicists, you know, mathematicians, engineers, geologists getting a, a whole different view of the world of possibility. So how was that experience for you? Do you have any highlights or just, just go into it? Ooh, uh, well, <laughs> the, the experience, yeah, I mean, to encapsulate it, um, I'll just tell you, and this will lead into actually the book um, that I wrote, Cosmic Philosophy, because um, the entire experience is what led to the writing of the book. And um, the basically what happened was I was in an ayahuasca ceremony and had a vision of the pyramids and the pyramids like spun around and then became, exploded into light and sacred geometry and I got the very clear message go to Egypt said, okay and um, six days later I was on a plane and the day that I had chosen to leave was the start of um, this trip with Resonance Academy I honestly had no idea what Resonance Academy was. I'd never heard of it before, but I was, um, I am friends with Nasim's ex-wife. And so when she found out that we were coming to Egypt, said, let me see if I can get you in and pulled some, some strings and got us into this trip. So I showed up having no idea what the trip was, had no idea even like what I would have done had I gotten to Egypt, not a part of the trip. Like I don't even, you know what I mean? Like scheduling tours or, or whatnot. So the whole thing was divinely orchestrated. I just followed, I've done, you know, I have a really, really reverent relationship with plant medicines and ayahuasca specifically. And so when I get a message like that, it's like, okay, I'm going to listen. I'm not going to dilly dally. And I just went. And so um, wound up in Egypt and my hot, like the highlight for me definitely in many ways intellectually was all the lectures. Like there were a lot of really powerful lectures and the art crystal 
uh, like that stuff was so cool. And then just cellularly, when we went into the pyramids on the night of the full moon and meditated inside each one for two hours, and um, I mean, six hours of pyramid meditations, uh, there was very little that could top that on like a cellular level. And um, yeah, so that was a highlight for me. And I'll, I'll wrap this up with how the book came to be, which was uh, the next at our closing dinner, maybe you'll remember this, do you remember the woman who came up and she had the microphone and she said, I have to go, my flight's here, but there's a message from the Pleiadians that I channeled with this because of Master Juan and I don't know who the Pleiadians are, but I just, I, they're gonna read you the message. Do you remember that? Uh, I don't know, I, I, I might've missed that. I, I, remember, so, I remember you talking a little bit, it sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, so this woman, just came up front and grabbed the mic and, and said goodbye and said that there was a message that was going to be read. And then maybe you remember this younger guy coming up with a Brazil, thick Spanish accent from Brazil and he read the message. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Gustavo. Is yeah. Gustavo. So, yeah, he's such an awesome uh, guy. Yeah, so, so he read the message that she channeled from the Pleiadians. And this woman had no idea who the Pleiadians were, never heard of them before. And so... For me, I immediately went, wait, hold on a second. How did she do that? Who is this dude? And so I spoke to the apprentice who got me a session with this master Juan. And so they came to my hotel room the next day and gave me a two hour session to activate and open my channel. Uh, and so I, in that session, I just started speaking and they recorded it. And then every day for the next month, I would get on the phone with him while he was in Brazil and he would take me through a very brief like reconnection meditation, what he called going up into the light. And he, at the end of those three to five minutes, he would say, you're in the light now, Adam, blessings. And he would hang up the phone and I would just start writing, like auto writing with my eyes half closed or all the way closed, just writing and writing and writing in the journal. And that would happen basically every single day. And um, at a certain point, I started sharing them with uh, my girlfriend and a couple friends and they're like, dude, you need to post those somewhere. And as I was meditating on it, it was just said, cause I was just gonna like post them on Facebook. It was like, no, 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 put them into something and send it out. And so that's how the book came to be. And that's why it's called A Month in the Light, Cosmic Philosophy, A Month in the Light. So that is how uh, the book came to be, which I thought you would find really fascinating since it all happened through ayahuasca and then Egypt. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. And then the Pleiadians. Yeah. That's, wow. uh, that's intense. <laughs> Holy yeah. smokes. Yeah. I, w I definitely want to hear, hear about this guy. Okay. So what, what are some of the things that came in the book? Like what is the book about? What can the reader expect? Well, the, the book itself is literally, um, I have a foreword and an introduction and then it's a collection of 30 of the channelings that I did unedited in basically their original form. And so um, they lived in my journal as scribble and I just put them into, into this book and then I would meditate on each entry and it would give me a question or a phrase that would serve as kind of like a prompt for each entry. And so the book itself, you'll see on the left page, there's a, a prompt or a question, and then the right page is the entry in its original form. And this goes back to what we were saying at the top of this podcast, which is, you know, frequency. You were talking about like putting, putting frequency out in words and stuff. I believe that the frequency, as they came through me, they really changed me and channel and, and um, the channelings are so dense and, and profound. A lot of them are so profound that I um, didn't want to put like any of my own in it. I wanted it to be original so that people could have the opportunity, literally just open the book to a page and receive the medicine. And so uh, it covers topics like sexual energy, food, money, uh, creativity. If I had to give one overarching kind of subject matter, it's frequency and an understanding of how our individual and collective frequency um, is is creating everything that we we see and everything and how we can create everything we want through that understanding. Wow, interesting. 
So the way uh, my mind is kind of putting this together, it's fascinating because the Resonance Science Foundation is all about frequency as well, right? It's coming into resonance, coherence, harmony, and it is a vibrational state. Um, it's pretty easy to feel that when you are in joy and bliss or real peace. If you're wherever you are, maybe sitting in nature, you're on the beach, whatever the case is, if you tune into your body, then you can feel this resonance. And sometimes when you're out of resonance, you're in stress, you're angry and all that kind of stuff. So it becomes very simple. So can you maybe dive a little bit deeper into one of those subjects, maybe those like how to feel a little bit more peace, like uh, what it what it shared about what either what money or about. sexual energy or, or any of the stuff that came through? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I could talk about any of these things, but I'll start with the one you said about kind of like, you know, when you're out of resonance or, or whatever we want to uh, term that. Um, one of the ideas that came through, and I, I want to specify, this isn't from the Pleiadians. Um, it's I have no idea. Like, I don't know where it came from. It just kind of came through me. And um, the one of the things that came through was uh, about the resistance to pain actually limiting your pleasure. So I think the quote itself is, resistance to perceived pain is limitation to possible pleasure. And that's one of, uh, of like that's one sentence of one of the channelings that came through one of the entries, and the idea of it is that uh, when we think of pain, we're assigning a value, we're saying this is negative, this is something that I don't want, this is something bad, and we're not talking about physical pain, like biologically, which we're predisposed, like don't touch something hot, but just even emotional pain, we're saying this is bad. When in reality, what there is, is there is a spectrum of emotion and it's all feeling, right? And at certain points we may say, oh, this over here on this end of the spectrum, this is the bad stuff and over here's the good stuff, but we're the ones assigning that value. So when you look at it as just frequency and say, you know, you have love and joy and bliss over here and you might have um, anger and sadness and, and shame and guilt over here, it's all it's all feeling it's all just one big spectrum and when you expand in, in any particular direction so say you go through an experience like egypt like we went through and i don't want to speak for you but i know more most of that experience happened changed me cellularly where i didn't even logically understand what was happening but i know i was being changed and so let's say i'm now expanded and you expand over here in the joy Let's even break it down more tangibly for people. Like, let's say you have a, a child, your first child, and you're like, love expands so much in this direction. Well, it's actually a polarity. And so when you expand in this direction, this end is also expanding. What you can experience in the depths of sadness, in direct polarity to what you can experience in the depths of love, will, will equally expand. And so... Anytime we resist going into our sadness or our jealousy or anger or, or whatever, because we say, that's pain, I don't want to experience that. What we're doing is we're preventing the expansion on this end of the polarity of our love and our happiness and our joy. So any resistance to emotion, to feeling, even if we think it's pain and we should avoid it, any resistance to it is actually a limitation to what we can experience on the other side of, of the positive end of the spectrum. So like that's an example of one of the things that came through. Awesome. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really deep thought because, you know, we, we are in this dimension of polarity. That's how we're experiencing everything. And we're also trained for good and bad, right and wrong, you know, whatever the case is. And touching on that, I think is really powerful because as you're saying it, you know, I've heard of concepts like that before and I agree with them. Then the challenge and the fear for me comes in is like, okay, uh, am I capable of the potential of the worst case scenario, right? You have a kid and the worst thing happens, your kid dies or whatever the case is. Am I capable of opening myself up to that amount of potential pain? And that, mm -hmm. I think, is where people get stuck. So I, I don't know even if I formulated a question, but did it give you any insight on how we can kind of navigate that? Because even just hearing that is I feel like 
even in my own life, I would have resisted things like that just because, you know, and, and ayahuasca will take you to places that really expand your emotional boundaries as well. And you just hope that you have the capacity to deal with something like that. So maybe you can kind of share um, how we can live in that polarity, but because it opens up the possibility, we don't have to necessarily live it, but there's a possibility it, it could happen. Yeah. Is that a good and, enough question? And so, yeah, well, to break it even <laughs> out of the realm of, of like frequency and generality, even like the moment you have, uh, like I have, I don't, I don't have a child, but I have a dog. That's basically like my girlfriend and my child. We love her so much. We take her everywhere. Uh, and until I had her, until I, I, we got her from, she was found on the street and like she was put into my arms. Until that happened, I had no idea of the amount of love that was possible for me in that particular way. The moment that that love became available, I now expanded in this end of the polarity of what it could be like to have her sick or die or to lose that love, right? And so the polarity naturally expanded in both directions. The moment you have your, the moment you now uh, fall in love for the first time, you're experiencing a whole new end of that spectrum. And you've now opened up the polarity of what it would be like to have your heart broken by that by by love and so that's that's a, a those are examples of the tangibles of what i'm speaking to and to go specifically to your question i have a belief and it's just how i live my life but one of my foundational beliefs is that the universe won't ever give you something that you are unprepared to handle and so whatever shows up whether that be the loss of a loved one or a dog or whatever if that shows up in your experience, it's because it is being called in by you for your X, Y, Z, whatever your development is for the intention that you've set. And we could go into whether we're talking about intentions set on like a cosmic multi-timeline level, or if we're just talking about, I have, so like I, if I have an intention, I want to, to be, a, a father that can um, teach my kids about X, Y, Z. Well, then I may in some way call in X, Y, Z to my experience along the way so I could be that type of father. And that is something where in, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, And I think that um, it takes a great deal of trust and so what you're saying is very true. If, if I were to lose like my girlfriend of nine years uh, or my dog or whatever, I know that that would be a process. That's not like me sitting here saying like, oh, I'd be cool because it's all happening for me. No, it would be a distinct process to go through. And my belief in this moment is that everything that is showing up in your experience is showing up for you. That is an excellent answer, my man. <laughs> it made me feel a little bit better. Um, uh, and, and I've been thinking a lot lately um, just about fundamental beliefs, fundamental beliefs about, uh, you know, people who are awakened or people who are empowered or people who um, just seem to be living peaceful lives, extraordinary you, lives, I fulfilled lives, lives. Extraordinary oh. lives, fulfilled lives. Oh, uh, can, you you, can you go back? I, you came back in at the fulfilled life. Can you just restate it? Yes. Um, I've been trying to decode the belief systems, the fundamental operating systems of people who are living fulfilled lives, peaceful lives, empowered lives. And so I'm glad that you touched on that fundamental belief. And I was curious if you had any more. So one of, one of the ones that I have is that uh, fundamentally, I believe that the universe is on my side. So the one that you said was really good. It's not going to give you any more than you can handle. I'm just curious if you have any more of those, if, it, if you can kind of bring to light some of the fundamental operating beliefs that you have that help you navigate this existence that can be really challenging, extremely frightening, um, and also glorious and multidimensional and beautiful and all the good words. All the good words. 
Yeah, I I mean, that's a, a really great question. I don't know that I've ever sat down and like outlined my beliefs because uh, one belief I have is that there's no um, there's no absolute truth. Like I, I don't believe I used to be the person who would sit here and tell you there's a black and a white, there's right and there's wrong, there's true and there's not true. And uh, I have since fallen away from that. And I think that there there is no empirical truth other than the truth of your, your own experience. And so that's that's a belief for me. Um, another belief is that we've chosen this life. I, I feel like um, my experiences in the esoterics have led me to believe that the life I'm living is one that I have chosen to live. And um, I also believe that I am co-creating my reality with, with the universe at large. So everything that's showing up, whether like I've been in car accidents that have led to surgeries and like all kinds of things, I believe that um, all of those things have been called in by me and um, for reasons that I may or may not understand in the moment or maybe even ever in my, my lifetime. But um, those are just a couple that are popping into my head. Uh, the closest thing I've gotten into about an absolute truth is polarity. I believe that we live in a a universe, a creation of polarity, and I think polarity may be the single absolute truth that I currently believe in. <laughs> awesome, those are really great, man. I awesome. yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And and off the top yeah, of their top sure. of your head, they're the they're. They're very good because, you know, this is like our, when we're talking about the unconscious, our deep belief systems are going to show up in our reality, you know, and for me, I always equate it to sport or coaching or things like that, because if you fundamentally believe that you will succeed, you will experience more success in your life. You'll experience failure too, but you don't perceive the failure as permanent or in the same way, somebody who would believe that they're a failure, whether it's from an upbringing or... Uh, a situation like where they feel, they feel like they're not good enough, enough anything like that, it's going to change how that experience like that. on the outside affects them from that, that fundamental operating system. Fundamental operating system. Yeah, and uh, also understanding that failure is uh, one of failure is one of those things that's not even um, like failure is not a uh, like empirical. Failure is one of those things where it's an assigned value. Right. And so like even you and I come from a sports background, like let's say you're running a marathon. There's one winner of that marathon, but there where failure is along the spectrum of where you finish, if it's out of a thousand people running it, maybe for for one person, all they wanted to do was actually finish. And so anything one to a thousand doesn't matter. It's all a success if they finish someone else. They're there to win it. And to them, second place is failure. Someone else, if I finish within this time frame, that's a success to me. And so like failure itself is a construct of our, our mind and it's completely relative. And so when you know that and you can recognize that, all of a sudden the consequences of failure that you give to yourself, you can see are also entirely your own choosing. So beating yourself up about a perceived failure is entirely your choice because no one else got to determine that's a failure for you. Yeah, that's an excellent point for sure. Um, and that's one of the things skateboarding taught me is like just skateboarding is just consistent failure. <laughs> and, then, and, and really it's just failure when you really give up because if you, you I've been watching the process a lot lately on YouTube and it's just skateboarders trying to do the trick. You look at the skateboard part and they're landing everything through the part, right? They'll show a couple bales here and there. But when you go through the process, maybe one trick took them like 30 tries, three days, 50 tries, whatever the case is, because they have it in their mind and they don't really fail until they either get hurt or they just give up. And so I think that the one thing that I like to share with people is that if you can give yourself a goal that's so heart centered that you're just going to be consistently moving towards your whole life, or at least for the period of life that feels good, that lights you up, then it's just, um, just a process and failure is not failure. It's just experience along the way because you'd be moving that way anyways. And just like in skateboarding and snowboarding and sports, 
there's no end. It's not like you get to the end of this goal, whether it's a business or, you know, you with your spoken word. It's like if I talk to 10,000 people, then it's done. Or Kyle Cease now who's blowing up, right? It's like, oh, well, if I fill up this stadium, then now I'm complete and I'm a yogi and I'm enlightened and it's all done. It's this core intention to spread a message that he feels that has value. And so if we can kind of align to that a little bit, it's going to make for a little bit of a different life experience. And so I guess my question for you is, have you ever thought about what your values are about life? Because I think that that's a big thing for people looking for more fulfillment, having an enjoyable experience is really focusing on what they value most and ensuring that they're experiencing that rather than putting more weight to somewhere where they, if they, if they were to look at it a little bit deeper, might not have the same value that they're giving it. Yeah. I mean, I can answer that in, in two different ways. One, just in one word, like my, one of my highest values is integrity. I think that integrity as an overarching value covers so many things it, because in, you can be alone in a room and be out of integrity. Like there is like, are you being honest with yourself? Are you being real with yourself? Are you um, being disingenuous with yourself and, and what you're actually thinking and feeling, et cetera. Um, and that carries out into how you interact with the world around you and people. And so like from a value, that's a huge value for me and how I live my life um, is to find that the word that I would say, the value that I strive for is alignment. Um, and alignment to me is when your uh, higher self, your super conscious, your conscious mind and your unconscious mind, all three of them are pointing in the same direction. To me, that's alignment. And so what happens for most people is they're like, consciously, I want to create this business. And like, that's my thing. And their unconscious mind is saying things like, oh, you're not smart enough. There's no way you'll ever do that. And so your unconscious mind is actually not working with you. It's not pointing in the same direction. It's pointing you in a different way, saying, don't try, don't do it, don't fail. And so alignment being such a huge value for me, um, I go deep into the work, whether it's plant medicines or sexual healing or uh, NLP or whatever it is, go deep into the work to reprogram the unconscious and deep into the spiritual to, to get a, a, a solid relationship and communication going with my higher self and put bring this all into alignment so that I can actually just live my life intuitively by following my highest excitement at all times and trusting that because I'm in alignment that the decisions I make from a place of joy and bliss and following that highest excitement will lead me to the mountaintops that I want to reach and like you said there's no there is no finish line the moment you you get to the mountaintop you're going to look over to that other mountaintop and be like oh okay i guess i'm not just going to sit here so i might as well go to that one and so what is the compass that you're using for me it's my alignment which leads to trust in intuition and trust in uh, my bliss that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's a really beautiful answer. Awesome, I like how you also mentioned the work, you know, how important that is to go in because that's all done through your conscious awareness and intention. You know, almost, I would say everybody on the planet, you know, the way that our mind works, it's almost like an operating system. And if we don't go into what we're thinking and what we're feeling, and this is why meditation and things like that are so important because they're going to bring those things to light. And then we can look at them and then we can actually go back and we can start to mess with the programming and install what we want. And this is so paramount in sport because in sport you're putting your body on the line, whether it's uh, you know the freestyle motocross riders or skateboarders, whatever. Um, you got to go into those fundamental belief systems because if you're about to do something that puts your body at risk – you better hope at that moment that your operating system is, I'm going to do this. Because if it isn't, you could get a result that you do not want. And so if we can take that type of necessity and pressure and, 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 and use it as fuel to just 
um, program ourselves in, a, in our everyday lives, we're going to upgrade a massive amount. We're going to be able to, and this is how you operate. This is, you just, it's one stage to the next because each stage is going to have a different, what's that saying? It's like a, every level has a different boss or something like that. And uh, so you're going to consistently <laughs> level up. So you're going to consistently level up. Yeah. And, and that's been a huge part of, of my last month, I would say, because going into 2018, I felt like I was whole for the, the first time, maybe in my entire life. I felt I was coming out of um, a plant medicine ceremony. I was coming out of four months of intense sex, somatic sexual healing work. And I just um, felt like, wow, I'm not actually looking for the next thing to fix about myself. I don't have like this next perceived flaw and got to sign up for this workshop or whatever. And that felt really, really good. And I thought going into 2018, it's like, boom, now it's just like smooth sailing, create and like shine so bright. And then uh, had this experience that had me realize we are, like you just said, every level has, has another boss. It's I had done a, a revolution of the Fibonacci. And so while it felt like I had come full circle, really what I had done was now I'm entering into just another spiral. Like it's another, another layer. And I thought that it was a, just a whole circle and I was mistaken. And so now um, there was a bit of mourning. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Like there was a bit of God, like more and you know, if when I'm in my highest state, it's I would tell you that that's that's why we signed up for this. You know what I mean? The expansion, the the journey itself is what we're here for. It's not about oh, I'm now all of a sudden completely done with the journey. Then then you die. So um, coming to terms with that again uh, is has been a big part of my last month for sure. Oh man, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, you got to give yourself that that little bit of space where you're you're like you want to celebrate the success, and then you're like, oh god, we're, I'm just at the bottom of this next at the bottom level. Of this next and uh, level. yeah, it's it's true, man. It is infinite expansion, and I like it. Kind of touches on what you mentioned earlier about the universe giving you what you can handle. You know, at that time, at that level, you're you're getting these challenges, and you're doing the work, and you're doing what's necessary. And then you kind of pass that level and it's like, okay, cool. Everything's good. Wait, here's a whole bunch more. It actually reminds me a little bit of Dolores Cannon because she would be channeling these, these beings through, are you, you're aware of Dolores Cannon, right? I'm not, I've, I've heard the name, but I haven't listened to her channeling. Oh God, she's so awesome. You, you'll, you'll love her. She's amazing. So, awesome. so she basically was doing past life so regressions and past life these beings were coming through. And, and talking to her, and she was religious, so for the first while, she's like, just ignored them. But they wouldn't go away, so she just started to write down what they were telling her. And she did this over years and years, and she would basically say that, like, once she would kind of piece together what they were kind of sharing, it would just add in a new piece a week later to something that would shatter the whole paradigm. And be like, okay, but if she said if she got that right away, it wouldn't have worked the same way. So I think that we're all linearly working this way consciously and adapting to this new realm of consciousness. And when we were in Egypt, there were some really uh, paradigm shifting thoughts, you know, right? Channeling Pleiadians, where do the pyramids actually come from? What is our actual uh, human history on the planet? And if we don't have the adaptability and the malleability to tune into the truth or to tune into a new paradigm that might challenge everything that we've ever experienced, as we move forward and options expand, which is what's happening as our consciousness expands and technology expands and the earth changes, it's going to be a little bit of a rougher ride. Um, so maybe you want to comment on that. I didn't formulate a question, but you can maybe comment. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I, I agree with what you're saying, and it's important to recognize, again, if we're living in this world of polarity, that as our consciousness expands and we are now able to see more 
positive, we're gonna, I'm gonna use the word positive, but like positive ends of the spectrum for technology and infrastructure and you know political systems and education systems and just a more positive way of of interacting with each other on this planet there's also the polarity of that there's more you know what i mean like we're we're seeing the options of uh many people would say donald trump getting elected president is an example of that they're like never could i have imagined that and nuclear war and all of these things because we're living in that world of polarity and so when we see the shadows come out it's important for us to remind ourselves that you know the shadows are only there to remind us that the light is like around the corner and so i think that w w being in egypt was so beautiful because i, I went to egypt and left with more questions than answers like, like I went there and I don't know if this is your experience, but when I got there, I, I said to myself, there's just no, there's just no way. And all the things that people had said about how things had happened, there's just no way. I remember we went down, um, I didn't know if that was Saqqara, wherever we were, where um, they had all those like 22 chambers or, that used to hold uh, pre presumably, allegedly like the Arks of the Covenant. But you had these 22 massive things that fit in a, a, like they barely fit through this hallway. There's no way that they were pulled by ropes. There was no way that, like there was no pulleys and levers and stuff to get this thing through that thing. So there's obviously some other form of technology. And all of the mysteries of Egypt that people are like, yeah, we just don't have any idea. It's... I left thinking, like, Egypt's even more mysterious to me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100% agree. That that yeah. was Saqqara. And, and the mysteries there are, there are, there are many. And the, and the interesting thing is I had uh, Hugh Newman on the podcast after I had Nassim on as well. And Hugh Newman was saying well. that there, there's possibly hundreds yeah. of thousands of sacred sites on the planet, things that – with all the science and technology and research that we have now, we have no idea how it was done. And so it's really, it's just really fascinating to explore. And I feel like this, this is the time, if you look at ancient texts across the board, it talks about um, the harvest or going through the veil. And I feel like this is a bit of a transitionary time. And I think you can speak to this doing ayahuasca because when you do ayahuasca, you're in a realm that is more real than here. And it can set up simulations in that realm. And if you kind of pass the test in the simulation, it'll give you another thing and you'll be in it. And you'll use the skill that you learned in the previous simulation. And if you do that, you kind of get a check and then it'll give you a different one, but you won't know anything that's happening. And when you come back, this reality back, seems less real, more like another simulation, like a like a playing ground. And maybe this veil is is, veil is this um, is this um, border between that reality to this higher consciousness. And I feel like we're we're getting to crack through that a little bit through internal work of, of ancient knowledge, like yogis and meditation, and also just planetary evolution and conscious evolution. So I'm not sure what your thoughts are on all of that, because Egypt and in the, in the you know, if you could if you could access the ayahuasca realm consciously, I'm sure you would figure out how to build that because it you're you're accessing infinitely more en uh, energy and information. Yeah, I see. So the veil to me is just the current borders of our um, range of frequency. So as human beings, we are transmitters and receivers of frequency. And so just like when someone uses a dog whistle, we as humans can't hear it, but dogs can. So there's that frequency obviously exists. The same with x-rays and gamma rays and things that you can't consciously see, but they're there. And so um, we are limited by the frequency bandwidth, the range that we have the capacity to receive and transmit. And as in history, we kind of have this egocentric viewpoint of, well, if it doesn't fall within the range of what we can perceive, it's not really real. And so for, for me, the veil is this 
this range of frequency that is available to us. And that includes um, uh, like people who are maybe extrasensory in the sense that they can see spirits and auras and things like that. But there's a, a barrier here where maybe you take some ayahuasca and you can peek beyond the veil. But for, for most people, they're gonna exist within this very particular uh, parameters of frequency. And so when you speak about the veil, um, thinning, what that means to me is the, the frequencies that are able to penetrate and the frequencies that are able to, and our ability to, to go beyond those uh, are becoming more and more. And that is a very good thing because it's turning people on. And so when you're seeing uh, this like massive global spiritual awakening, this expanding consciousness that's happening, what you're also getting is uh, more people having experiences with, with extra terrestrial beings of some kind, having experiences of channeling Pleiadians or angels or whatever, um, having experiences of seeing, you know, sacred geometry in the sky and things like that, that's becoming more and more commonplace. And I used to think that I would just write that off as being, oh, that's just trendy. Like, oh, it's cool now to like say you're channeling whoever. And from a, a more like, physics standpoint, if we're, we're talking, you know, uh, theoretical metaphysics here, but like as more and more people awaken, as your, as Matt Belair, as your frequency bandwidth expands, the people you come in contact with are now experiencing a, a greater range of frequency. So it's going to make them more susceptible and able to be entrained into greater and greater ranges of frequency. And as that happens, they're going to be more susceptible to receiving those frequencies. And you are naturally like, that's the way that it would be. One of my very first ayahuasca ceremonies, um, I brought up a concern like this to, to the grandmother spirit. I said, well, how do I know it's actually true? Right. And she said, how else would it be? Like if, if it was actually true, if it was really going to happen, how else would it look? Like it would look like this. And so th that's where it becomes a matter of, of faith, right? You either get to choose, oh, this is just a trend and it's, it's coincidence or whatever, or you get to choose to have faith that it is what it is in that way. And, and, and there's no real way to prove it in my mind. And that's where faith comes in. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, I had Unity Grace on the podcast Unity again Grace yesterday, podcast and again she is yesterday. very next level. And we've had private very conversations very as well conversations. that are really, really mind blowing. I met her in person, by the way. Really oh, nice. Where? Burning Man? Oh, nice. Where? Um, I met her. So I met her in Venice, California. We were at a, a, this place, Full Circle in Venice, and we were having this circle. It was like a sound meditation sound bath and a bunch of people fell asleep and myself included but when we woke up we did like a circle share and I admitted to falling asleep and anyway this woman started speaking and I immediately got this message go speak to her like you need to speak to her and it it was unity grace oh wow she yeah, opened amazing. she opened my whole oh, wow. yeah, she amazing. blew my mind with like <laughs> those like Ill illuminati like sacred sites and like things that are happening that you would think are only in the movies. Like she blew my mind into what's possible in that arena. Yeah. Well, it's fitting that you came on the podcast. You're, you're the one directly after her because it, she explored after some her. concepts yesterday that are, that are yes. really, really out there. And what I constantly say about my work and having these guests on is that I'm able to touch these realms and I've been in them like ayahuasca and through deep meditation and these experiences that go so far beyond the physical sense, so far beyond what I can perceive. And so I open to the possibility of these other realms because I've experienced them and I can see these people like unity that are sharing, but they're not sharing because they, they want to write books. They want to be cool. They want to make money. They're sharing because it's just like, this is what's happening to me. And I'm just going to share what I'm experiencing and you can kind of take, take it or leave it. So, uh, and one of the things that she touched on was as we move into this higher state of awareness and these, these, uh, bigger possibilities that are just harder for us to 
grasp. So one could be Dr. Joe Dispenza. We talked uh, a lot about some people might believe it's total crap that you could heal yourself with your mind. Yet many people are doing it through meditation. And he's just trying to bring the science because he says it's the language of the day. And so one of the things that she spoke about was, are we really ready to accept mystical experiences? Are we ready to accept that if, if you hear something or you see something that it's just random or, um, or it's actually a message for you? And, and one of the things that I like as a fundamental operating system is that everything is perfect now and the universe is always communicating with you. So whatever you receive and you experience so is for you. And if you can learn to really be in the present moment and really be aware, you can ask yourself any question at any time and you don't even have to do anything mystical. It's just be present. And the universe is going to bring you something in and you can say, oh, that's a coincidence. Like, no, well, what does that mean to you? And it just kind of brings you these things to help filter out uh, the question or concern you have through just simple, basic awareness. simple, basic awareness. Yeah, I'm one of those dudes, you know, despite the fact that I just wrote a channeled book, uh, I'm one of those <laughs> dudes who is very, very like logical, practical, science minded. I love science and um, I love logic and the language of logic. And so things, it's important for me that they make sense logically in order for me to actually take them on. And it doesn't necessarily mean they can be proven by today's science, but it does mean that there is a kind of logical way in which it came about. And for me, my path of, of awakening happened because there was just, <laughs> excuse me, that sneeze was a long time coming on. <laughs> You're blessed. Excuse me. Um, so for me, there was more, it would have been harder to believe that all of the data was coincidence. So it had gotten to the point where it kept piling up and piling up and piling up in a very short window of time, basically like one week. And it was a choice point where I said, it's actually harder for me to believe that all of that is a coincidence. And rather than some, some universal like flow that is pointing me in a direction. And when that, when that scale tipped, that was enough for me to go, okay, like I believe now. And then from there, from that point of choosing to believe, I applied what you have too, what I see in you, which is just, I have this work ethic and desire to be great and, and all of these things where it's like, if I'm going to believe that this spiritual esoteric way of living is the way that the universe operates. If I'm going to choose to believe in the law of attraction and, and all of that, well, I want, I want to be great at it. Like I want to understand it. I want to know how to use it. I want to know how to have those rules work for me and, and create what I want to create in this experience. And so I dove headfirst into all of this, like nonstop for years. And for those people who are on the fence, because there's a lot of people who can listen to this podcast or my podcast or whatever, and kind of be on the fence of like, yeah, like I believe some of it and I believe other. what you're doing in my opinion is you're shortchanging your ability to create the life you want to lead. You can choose not to believe any of it totally, but that means you believe something else and go ahead and make those rules, whatever it is, work for you. Or you can choose to believe all of this over here and it's like, great, but like choose it and make it work for you. Get good at understanding the mechanics of it either way. But when you're one foot in, one foot out, you're, you're not maximizing the, what's available to you. Yeah. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And it is a process, you know, I could see how people because you know, are resistant because it's not the norm. And I a hundred percent agree that when you kind of go into it and this is where the faith thing comes in. And this is kind of like your connection with yourself 
and spirit and source. Basically, you know, you, you walk out into the middle of the woods or the desert or whatever, and you're like, I am connected to nature. I am a part of source. I am a part of all of this, and I am taken care of. You know, in the meditations I do at the beginning and end of the podcast, they kind of go through connecting to source energy, but also being supported from the earth as well. And then your heart and your being is that unique signature in all of it. It's just you sending out a very unique signature, but you are supported from the earth and you are a part of source as well. And so it does require faith because this goes beyond the mind. And that's why nobody gets a free pass. We're starting to understand it more scientifically, but it really is a leap of faith. But it's a it's like a leap of faith in collaboration and goodness and resonance in nature in yourself. And so it just requires a letting go of old habitual thoughts and beliefs and paradigms and and a little bit of work. So yeah, I totally resonate with, with everything you just said there. Everything you just said there. Yeah, and I, I would even challenge the idea that it's not the norm. Like supernatural spiritual beliefs have been around as early as man, right? Like you, um, they look different, they take different forms throughout history, but there has always been like a prevailing belief in something bigger than us. And most people know the term as God. And, but like the idea that there is some force, some force of some kind that is beyond us, that is at play in some way, shape, or form. And um, when you get into the actual stories of any religion, the, the stories are filled with the supernatural. Whether you wanna believe in angels, or like the burning bush, or uh, you know, parting of the sea, or um, like so many other things, there, there's been um, these beliefs. And, and for whatever reason, uh, the, the norm, right? That idea of what is normal is, uh, can be so limiting sometimes, maybe oftentimes just so limiting of what is normal because there's not really, if you take any like cut of the timeline of human history, no, it's not normal now what was normal then. So there is no like empirical normal. Yeah, I think that's a really an amazing point because I can just say for, from my experience growing up, we have this cultural norm and there's pressure to abide by it, whether it's to go to college. My, mine was uh, go to college, university, or I'm dumb. And so I wasn't going to go to university because I had to do an extra year of high school and then four more years. I was a five-year swing when I just wanted to go to the mountains. And so – so I think we I think it's a really good point to make because it's just a normal in some circles like the normal in people who go to Dr. Je Joe Dispenza's workshops or go to Burning Man or go to you know through the uh, the delicate foundation with resident science those are different norms and I would prefer to live in a in a universe where miracles are normal and I think Wayne Dyer has a uh, book even has called that uh, miracles are normal or something like that. Um, but it does uh, create a belief system <laughs> to allow that light and frequency in, because if you're shutting it down as the receiver, if we emit a signal and we receive, if we don't have the capacity to open up to that possibility of frequency, right. To bring in a possibility into our reality, it's not happening. So really good point. Really good point. Yeah. And, and, I'm curious too for a lot of people because I was that person. I get it. I was the skeptic. I was like, if you can't show it to me with hard science, it doesn't even exist. And um, didn't believe in in any sort of connected energies and things like that. And uh, now I'm aware that mo like if you were to just do a survey of of people who have had some form of miracle or supernatural experience in their life it would be the vast majority of the population. At some point in your life, you've experienced something that you just cannot explain. It seems like challenging even the levels of what you think a coincidence is. And like that, that is something that's so, like the vast majority of people have experienced and yet we still call it a miracle. We still call it a, a miracle as if it's something that happens so rarely. 
but it doesn't. It's happening right now. In this second, people are experiencing, multiple people are experiencing miracles all over the planet. And so I think we can get, we can start to release the idea that somehow, some way, those things are rare and recognize that actually they're super common. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, I totally believe that as well. I, th I think uh, I'm trying to remember the quote. It's something along the lines the that miracles the lines are just, um, are you know, just, nature's way of acting uh, or miracles are just nature acting uh, without your resistance or something like that. I'm butchering it, but I'm going to, I'm going to find it. But it was basically, it said that, na you know, miracles are just normal. It's just, just nature doing its thing. Um, and we just have to allow it to happen. So, so yeah, I think it's a really important. And again, it's, it's our operating system, right? It's our unconscious mind and our, and our belief systems that are going to affect the reality because our unconscious mind and our thoughts affect our reality for sure. So we're going to have to clean that up and do the work to allow more light, more awareness, more frequency in so we can actually experience these things for ourselves. And then it becomes real for you because someone who's experienced a miracle or um, connects with this type of energy, they're going to have real experiences for them where there's no way you're going to convince them it's not real. And it's just like, that's fine. You can have your belief, but I'm operating within this natural law, within nature. Um, so you can believe what you want, but you could also operate over here as well. Um, so I think what I wanted to ask you, brother, um, it's really good to connect again. Um, I'm so happy you came back on. I'm glad I was able to do this. I took like a little bit of a hiatus to, to catch up. Um, but is there anything that you wish that I had asked or you wanted to go deeper on? Anything about your book, uh, Egypt, just anything in general that you wanted to share? Dude, I feel like we have covered so many topics and we have gone pretty deep on, on a lot of them. Um, I'm just really glad, you know, there's, there's, I value people who can um, play at this level of, of consciousness and conversation. And so uh, that's why I love your podcast and, and what you're uh, doing in the world. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have an amazing conversation with you. Oh, thank you, brother. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm, um, I'm so happy that uh, you're out there, you know, doing the work and, and putting out such amazing content for people to experience. And yeah, just committed to the path and, and, and being the example, right? Just actually being it. There's a big difference between, like you said, being on one side and, and not embodying the principles, but it they really are quite simple. And the more you can do it, you know, you kind of earn... You know, you kind of uh, your way in the universe where you're going to get that comeback after you've kind of passed these levels, right? There's no cheat codes. There's no skipping to level 20. And it's just a slow process that's done with integrity. So uh, appreciate you and your work as well. So where can people find you? Uh, when is the book coming out? Um, give them all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, so kind of good stuff. yeah, by the time this is posted, the book will be out. Uh, the Kindle version is already out. Uh, the print and audio version have all, that should be up in the next like 24 hours. So this this book, Cosmic Philosophy: A Month in the Light, is available on Amazon. Um, and if you go to adamroa.com, A-D-A-M-R-O-A.com, you will be able to see uh, the book. You will be able to see the podcast, the Deep Dive with Adam Roa, and you will also be able to see my social media, which is adam.roa on Instagram and Adam Roa on Facebook. So that's the easiest way to get a hold of me and find me and follow along on the journey, which if, if this kind of stuff resonates with you, then, then I encourage you to follow along because uh, I love this stuff. I geek out on it, <laughs> just like you. Yeah, awesome, brother. Well, it's a pleasure to be going down the stream with you, and I'm so glad that we connected in person and uh, just, just excited to know you and, and happy that you're doing everything that you're up to. So just a pleasure to converse with you again, man. Thanks for coming on. And man, thanks for coming on. Thank you, brother. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Peace. Everybody, thanks for coming.